Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to our Father. Thank you, Jesus. If you just remain standing and let us uh, pray. Father, we thank you for this time coming together, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you would rain your bread on us this morning. Oh, let us feed on your word and enjoy it. Even as we did last week when we enjoyed the feast prepared for our mother. We give you glory for what you're about to do in this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And as you take your seat, tell somebody God loves you. God loves you. And so do I. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs chapter 9. In the book of Proverbs chapter 9. And we're going to be reading from verse 1. Uh, we, we, are, we are not going to ration ourselves today. We, we're going to read a little bit more of the Word of God. We're not going to ration ourselves. And as you find your way to Proverbs chapter 9, reading from verse 1, I just want to take the time to thank my God and my Savior, the bread from heaven, who feeds me and makes me taste and see the goodness of the Lord. And I like to thank him for leading me in the path to my wife. I want to thank my wife, a pastor in her own rights, who is so supportive of the work of God. And I would be amiss if I didn't thank the pastor and the shepherd of this house, Pastor Gary Williams and Lady Mahata, who answered the call of God, which he spoke to Peter and said, feed my flock. And every week, he comes to feed the flock of God. We thank God. We thank God. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. And she has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Who ever is simple? Let him turn in here. I'm reading from King James Version, but you might be seeing it from another version. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and leave and go in the way of of understanding. And let's just jump to verse 13, 1, 3. And here we see a picture of another one, woman. A foolish woman is glamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. For she sits at the door of her house on a seat by the highest places of the city to call to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Oh, I, I heard that before. She's using the same thing. And as for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. Oh, my Lord. The subject of my message today is the invoice. The invoice. An invoice is an itemized bill for goods sold or services provided containing individual prices, the total charge, and the terms. And I know some of you hearing that may be like, well, is there going to be a charge for this? I assure you, what I'm talking about today is free. Well, Brother Bo, are you taking us to business class? It's about my father's business. You know, when I was in sales, when I, what we learned in sales is that when a customer was coming and they wanted to look at a car, you know, the first thought they will always have is, what's the price? What's the cost? Tell me how much this cost. And we were told that you don't bring up the cost 
until you build the value. That you have to tell them that, I understand the price is important, but let's make sure this is the right car for you, and I assure you I'll get you the right price. And you build the value on that. Even when you are selling a house, you want to build the value so when you go out and you show the house, you tell the people, can you see yourself in that backyard preparing on the 4th of July that party? I've seen a lot of house shows, so I know how they do it. Can you see yourself in that den? I know you wanted a den. How about that den? Or you like that kitchen, right? You are not happy with the previous kitchen, but look at this kitchen. And once the value is built, then they present to you the cost. And any time that value exceeds cost, a transaction is made. I've come to talk to somebody today who is struggling with an inferiority complex. I've come to talk to somebody today who feels that they're not worthy, who don't think they're valuable. I've come to tell you how valuable you are. Because when God looked down the ages of time and saw you and you and you and me, he said the value exceeds the cost. And on the cross, Jesus Paid the price. That's how valuable we are. We are not redeemed with silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. But what I also found out is that in sales, sometimes people make irrational decisions. They make irrational decisions. And we know that sometimes Bad things happen to good people, and they might have bad and challenged credit. Maybe they declared bankruptcy. So when they come, I would very much like to try to get them to build themselves up. You know, maybe look at this Kia or this Hyundai, and they'll say, oh, I want that BMW. I want that Mercedes. I want that Highline. And I'll be like, okay. And then I'll present to them, and I'll say, well, this is the payment for the Hyundai, and then this is the payment uh, for the BMW, it's $900, or oh, it's $1,200, what, what do you think? And they'll say, mm, I know it's more than my rent, but I'll go for the BMW. And they make irrational decisions, and I used to wonder why sometimes this happens. You know, psych psychologists say that, you know, you have the real you, you know, you, who is calm, who is collected, logical, driving, and having the steering wheel. But in the back seat, what a lot of people don't realize is that there is a caveman. They call him the caveman, and some call him the monkey, who does not react or respond just like everybody else, but they respond and react irrationally in a survival instinct. It's either fight or flight. And every time what we don't realize is that this caveman jumps in and takes over the steering wheel. And we make irrational choices. Now I know science is always catching up to the Bible. So I realized, and, and we've been in the book of Romans, that Paul already talked about this. In Romans chapter, five, chapter 7, Reading from verse 15, Paul talks about this condition. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. Romans chapter 5 verse 15. For what I will do that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now... It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will, I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I would do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil is present with me, 
the one who wills to do is present, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And what Paul is saying is that your real self is the spirit. Your spirit is the real you. Collect it. Calm. But you got the flesh that you got to deal with. And the flesh tends to make those irrational decisions. You, you buy that BMW, but the next morning, you get down there to your garage, and you say, oh, what have I done? What did I do? What got into me? Oh, my God. How am I going to deal with this? What was I thinking? How did this happen? Is there a cooling off period? You know, I went to a timeshare presentation one time because I'm also susceptible to these things, just like all of us. So I went to a timeshare presentation, and I like going to that. And one of the requirements I told my wife is that if we see a timeshare that has Zimbabwe on it, I'm, I want that. That's the one I want. But it gave me an opportunity to see how different people practice sales as well. And we went into this beautiful, this was a beautiful presentation of a timeshare. I mean, the, the place was nice, the finishings were, were great, the design of the place that you would come and enjoy your vacation was lovely. And it was more so, this presentation, I believe, was more so uh, better because previous to that, we had gone to another timeshare presentation where it was chaos. They were noisy, they were having bad sales techniques that they were using. And at one point during that presentation, my wife got into it with the, with the salesperson. I had to stand in between them and say, oh, I, no, 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 I'm on vacation here. I, I, I just didn't feel like I had time to go to the police station and answer questions. My time was more important. But having experienced that, we came to this one and everything about it was lovely. I, I, they had Zimbabwe on there too. And they put off, took off some, some dollars for me. And I looked at it and I said, what do you think? Maybe should, we, should, I, should we do this? And she said, whatever you want. And I was about to press the buy button. But something inside said, sleep on it. I said, sleep on it. And, I, and we said, no, we're going to have to sleep on this. And we went home. I mean, we went to the hotel. And the next morning, I woke up and I said, you know, that would have been the biggest mistake of our, of our life so far because we're not ready for that. And she's like, you know what? I agree 100%. Why? Because the flesh had taken over. And it's the flesh that causes you to wonder, what have you put yourself into? What is this? That you have got me into. Oh my Lord. Is there a cooling off period? I gave myself a cooling off period. Now the laws that have been established in the country. Pertaining to certain goods and services. Do give you a cooling off period. Three days. Because they know. That that vacuum salesperson can come. She or he. And charm you. And, ca and cause you to buy a $3,000, $2,000 vacuum cleaner. And yet in your house, most of it is hardwood. And then you say, oh, wait a second. I can't even afford my mortgage. What did I do? So they give you a three-day cooling period. So that you can say, I'm sorry, but here you go. I, I, this is not for me. Thank you so much. Whew, I got away from that. Because the flesh responds and acts differently than the spirit. 
they all have are inclined to a different persuasion. Which leads me to our text today, where we have the, wis the woman wisdom and the woman folly, and they're both calling out to the simple and to those who lack understanding. And just in case you say, I'm out of that category, I say, let put, we all have been simple and lacking understanding until we found the word of God. They are calling out. To the simple and, other, and those who lack understanding. And the message seems to be the same. Come, all you who, who are simple and lack understanding. And the woman folly says the same thing. Come, all you who are simple and lack understanding. But there is a difference. It's the same thing, but it's different. The woman wisdom has taken time to prepare a feast. She has killed the beast. She has prepared the food and mixed the wine. The furnishings, everything is in order. But the woman folly only has water and bread. But she is enticing. She is clamorous. She is noisy. You know how the people who are out there and they get noisy, they get your attention. You have the woman wisdom who is that good salesperson who comes from the heart and wants something that is going to benefit you. Something that you're going to enjoy and taste and see of the goodness of the Lord. She wants you to have that. Have life. And have it abundantly. And you have the woman folly. And she is the bad salesperson. She is deceitful. And their tactics are designed to catch you in a trap. And here you are. Caught. Between the spirit and the flesh. Between the spirit and the flesh. Wondering what to do. You know the world... Even, th even though their messages sounded the same, they were different, the world similarly has taken some stuff from the church and made it their own. I used to love the rainbow. The picture of the rainbow was my delight because it symbolized the covenant that God made with man through Noah. And now if I were to wear a t-shirt or a shirt that had the rainbow now, people look at me a little funny and a little strange. We talk about meditation. Meditate on the word of God that you may have good success. That's what the word of God says. But some people say, uh-uh, I've heard about that stuff. Meditation somewhere, uh-uh. Can't do that. Because the world has taken it and stolen that. We hear about, in the Bible, put on the helmet of hope. Hope in God. And the world takes it and says positive thinking. It's the same, but it's different. One is about faith in themselves. Faith in the man. The other one is about faith in God. Put your hope and your trust in God. It's the same, but it's different. We talk about confession. We talk about proclamation. Saying the same as what God says about you. And God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. They talk about affirmations. It's the same, but it's different. And in this world, we find ourselves that everybody has, just like these two women, access to us. They have platforms in which they can talk to you. You've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, you've got YouTube, and now I hear there's even another one called Thread. Everything is out there. And they're all calling your attention, trying to get you in to their business. And uh, you go on Facebook, right next to the preacher's page is the pimp's page. And they have a message. And they're trying to entice you. Here the preacher is trying to, like the pastor was saying, pull you out of the pit. But the pimp is trying to push you into it. And you don't even see it. 
The world has given everybody an, a platform, everybody a high place that they can speak into your life. And one is persuading your flesh. And the other one is speaking to your spirit. And who will you listen to? And the thing about the flesh and the woman folly is that unlike the woman wisdom who has to actually send out her maidens, send out the preachers, and, and, and talk to the people, get out there. She, has to just, she just sits at the doorsteps of her house. Because it's so much easier in this world to entice people because of the flesh. Now, if you think you can just go to a nightclub and some, of, some people say, well, why don't you just go like to a strip club and, and, and you know, talk to the people? Maybe you being in the strip club will cause the people there to, to love God. I'm like, no. Chances are, if you keep bad company, if you associate with angry people, if you associate with those people that are bad company, the probability is that you are going to be corrupted yourself. That's the nature of this world. So she doesn't have to do as much work as the preacher has. And sometimes I feel like one of those maidens who has been called out to preach the word. And I feel like I'm a janitor. That I've got to go and cleanse out what the pimp has been putting out. And preach this good news of the word of God. It's the same that they speak, but it's different. Well, Brother Bo, how, how can I tell the difference? One of the things that you can tell the difference is location, location, location. I told you it was a little business class. Because the first thing that God asked Adam when he had ate of the forbidden tree was where are you what's your location and if you can figure out the location whether this is coming from above or this is coming from beneath then you'll be able to discern truth from error for every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above from the father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning God is love. And if he were to correct you, he is doing it in love that you may grow or you may be taken out of a situation. And sometimes the only way that you can develop that discernment is to, steer, is to, is to eat the right food. They always say that we are what we eat. But I'm more concerned about the spirit than I am with the flesh. And if we take the time to always feed on the Word of God, if we take the time, and sometimes if we can, uh, get into those Bible studies because you can question there and say, wait a second, I, I was thinking this, but you can't do it when I'm preaching. I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh, no, no, sit down. I, I'm, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. But you can do it during those places, and you grow. And when you have tasted and seen then you are able to discern. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, uh, Paul uh, writes and he says to the people, he says, you are not ready yet uh, to, to hear more because I still have to feed you with milk and not with meat. But in Hebrews 5 verse 14, he says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And when we take time in the word of God, we are strengthening ourselves, maturing, training ourselves to distinguish good from evil. So we see that the woman folly is nothing but an imitator. Because Satan is not a creator. He is only a copycat. And all his cohorts are, are nothing but copycats who will bring the message and it sounds the same, but it's different. 
But unfortunately, we all have eaten from the woman folly. Every one of us. And the thing about the woman folly when you have eaten from her, with, from her table is that after you have eaten, she puts an invoice on the table. After your short-lived pleasure, she pushes an invoice on the table. And the Bible tells us that her guests who are there are dead. They're in the depths of hell. And when you look at that invoice, you say, oh my God, what have I done? How did I get myself in this situation? Oh my Lord, this is a bad deal. The, the value is so much less than the cost. This is an exceeding cost. This has been the cry, even from Adam all the way down the generations, that when he ate of the fruit in the Garden of Eden, the forbidden fruit, he realized that the wall of mankind had fallen. Oh my God, how did I get myself into this position? What took me? What happened? How did I get here? How did this happen? The woman folly has pushed that invoice on the table. And I've come today to talk to somebody who's, who has had the invoice from the enemy pushed into the table of their heart. The in voice. A voice that tells you that Satan has his claim over you. A voice that accuses you every time the enemy has pushed the invoice on the table. You took the bait. You got trapped. And you are like the man who wakes up in the morning after buying that BMW and you're like, oh my God, what have I done? How did I put myself in this? The evidence is there that you did it. You signed the contract. The evidence is there in the woman Folly's house that you were there and you ate of her food. Your DNA, your fingerprints, they're all over the place. You did it. She's got the picture. Here's the invoice. And from Adam all down the generations, there have been a cry. Oh God, what did I get myself into? Oh God, is there a cooling off period? Is there a cooling off period to get me out of this situation? I got myself into a bind. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have partaken of this. The fr this fruit from this woman. I was enticed. I got trapped. Oh God. Here I am. Have mercy. Is there a cooling off period? To everybody who has eaten from the woman folly. I got a word for you this morning. Yes, there is. There is a cooling off period. Three days. Three days is the message of the gospel. The gospel is about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Three days. On the third day, he rose with all power in his hand to answer the invoice of the enemy. He rose on the third day. There is a cooling off period. You don't have to carry that burden. And I'm glad the pastor was praying today for every burdened person. I'm glad the pastor was bleeding the blood. Because when you're burdened, you got to call on the Lord. you got to call on the blood. It has been paid. There is the cooling off period. And it is a statute that God was not, did not get to be surprised about. 
He instituted it even before the foundation of the world. The lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And we see the picture even when Adam had sinned with Eve. God had to uh, get them skin coats, coats. And if he had to do that, the blood had to run of an animal. And the soul of the creature is in the blood. And we say it in Abel. We see the blood in Abel. When Cain partook of the food from the woman folly and killed his brother. And the Lord said, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, I hear the voice. I hear the voice of the blood of Abel. I hear the voice of the blood of Abel. There is a voice in the blood. The, in Egypt, the Israelites were free from their bondage and their burdens when the blood of the Lamb flowed. God told them, He said, Slaughter a lamb, have them put the blood in the basin, and then with the hyssop, take it and put it on the entry, the doorposts of your houses, and get in there. Because there are things, people, and angels, and principalities who can hear the voice of the blood. And when the tenth angel comes, he will hear the voice of the blood and he will have to pass over and say, this is not the place for death. This is not the place for a loss because we have pleaded the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. It is still speaking of our lives. The Bible says that the there is the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Because the blood of Abel was speaking vengeance. It wanted vengeance. But the blood of Jesus is calling for, your, for mercies over us. It's calling for mercies. So I've come to tell you this morning that there may be voices out there. You have the voice of the woman folly. You have the voice of the woman wisdom and the preachers who bring, whose feet are beautiful because they're bringing the good news. But you have another voice, the voice of the blood. And it is sitting in the highest of places in the mercy seat of God. And the blood is speaking over us and it is asking for mercy. It is asking for your messes and for mine. The blood stops the works of the enemy. The blood draws a line and a distinction and says, these are touch nots. We, bleed, we have to plead the blood. We have to hedge our territories by the blood of Jesus. The blood is still speaking. The voice of the blood of Jesus will never stop speaking in our lives. Saints of God, it is time to leave the stolen waters. It is time to leave the bread eaten in secret places. And it is time to eat from the gospel, the good news. Or taste and see that the Lord is good. Enough is enough of the enemy bringing the invoice to us. Causing you to be in a tailspin because it keeps reminding you of that invoice. So you keep beating yourself up. But enough of that. Because the blood has answered. The blood has answered and paid the, the price for us all. 
In the book of Isaiah, I'll, I'll close with this. Isaiah chapter 55. And I'll read from verse 1. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. I told you it was going to be free. Without money and without a price. And I'll just skip to verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and you will have mercy on him and to our God for you will abundantly pardon. There is a cooling off period for all of us. But we got to take advantage of it while we still can. The time is short on any given cooling off period and you don't know when that expiration for you and i is going to be so we got to have we have to take advantage of the cooling off period and call on the lord while he is near call on the lord while he is near i'd like to pray for us now i don't know who today and I'm glad the pastor already prayed over the burdens. So I'll, make, I'll offer a prayer of thanksgiving. May have come in facing an invoice that the enemy kept showing you. Something you did in your past. Brings it up to your face time and time again. But I've come to let you know this morning that that invoice has been paid by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't matter what you did. Doesn't matter how long you stayed at the woman for his dining table. Doesn't matter how much you ate from her food. But when you get to receive the cooling off period, you got to go out there and you got to vomit it all out. But you go, you, you have not, you can't be like a dog who goes back to eat that vomit. We are vomiting the stuff that we have been fed. Every lie of the enemy. Everyone that has been putting burdens on the lives of the children of God. But God is sovereign, he is not surprised. And he put a cooling off period because he knew that Paul one day will make a mistake. He knew that brother this and sister that will make the mistake. But I got a cooling off period for them. And I'm going to make a transaction because I look down and I see the value in my children. I'll pay the cost. Father, we thank you for these in your house today. We give you glory and we rejoice, our Lord. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We have plead the blood of our spirit, souls, and bodies. And we thank you, Lord, that we are covered by the blood. We give you glory for what the blood is speaking of our lives right now. That the blood says we are the righteousness of God. That the blood says we are the sanctified of God. The set apart ones. The called out ones. The chosen ones. We are distinct because of the blood. So we thank you Lord that the enemy has no claims over us. Yes. Nothing in us, nothing over us. Because of the blood of Jesus. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. We give you glory, O oh God. We give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.